Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. It's very nice to be here. Um, yeah, I don't know how much uh, or how many experts we have here. Uh, but before we start, very quick introduction. This is me back in the day uh, where I was in good terms with racers and, and scissors. Now, not so much. Uh, but yeah, I did a bunch of consulting before jumping into startups and scale ups, and I discovered Web3 by accident, uh, and here I am. Um, some disclaimers as usual uh, my views are my own. Um, I don't represent any company. Uh, this is not financial advice or legal advice, uh, maybe mental health advice, but that's a conversation for later. Um, and yeah, this is the dilemma that uh, I and probably we face every time that uh, we do one of these. Is like, should I go very introductory and try to be as welcoming as possible for, for newcomers? Or should I go and hit that governance uh, niche geek section where we're super passionate and it's like, I don't know, 30 of us uh, talking about this. So the agenda and the objectives uh, hopefully cover that uh, today. So first, I'm going to do a super quick introduction to DAOs. Uh, hopefully, uh, some of you find it useful. Then I'm going to share a bit more about uh, governance design. Um, yeah, again, this is quite niche, but uh, I might get some of the newcomers passionate about it to be able to, to move forward. And yeah, going to go through a real use case uh, and, and how we, by flipping one of the, of the concepts, we, we change a lot of, uh, of things and hopefully that clicks everything together for you. And finally, I'm going to give you like some when I was your age piece of advice if you want to join the, the industry. All right, so that was before they were cool. Uh, that was our decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, some uh, smarter people than me out there like to call them decentralized collective organizations uh, because the autonomy might be, uh, might not be there entirely. But before we dive deeper, a couple of examples that you might be familiar with. Alcoholic Anonymous is a very well-known organization. It's been in existence forever. Uh, and it includes thousands of groups uh, that are helping each other. Pretty much anyone can start a chapter, uh, so that's how decentralized it is. Uh, you just need to follow some rules, uh, have some experience. They help you with uh, with material and stuff, but uh, but it's it's relatively easy to to do that, and and that's uh, that's by design. Um, and then yeah, something important: you can adapt it to the local needs of uh, of wherever you are. So if you feel that something I don't know, doing something online or or having like a huge group is it's better for for the whole community, then you're welcome to do so. Another one more on the for-profit department. This is a Spanish company. It's relatively unknown, but it's uh, it's quite big. It uh, yeah, revenues on the on the billions. Uh, it has over 75,000 employees, and there's this very clear process if you want to join this uh, kind of like cooperative, how to do it, but they, they do have the process online, but all the way to the, to the point where they have a bank that's ready to support you if they like your business plan, so you might be in business uh, much, much faster. Uh, so again, that's another example of kind of like a DAO. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the power of Web3 is here, and that means that right now we are able to create these organizations much, much faster, experiment with them, take some learning, see what's working, see what's not, and, and move from there. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we can talk about that later, or, or come see me afterwards. Um, so now, when would you DAO or not? Um, Again, you do not always need a DAO. Maybe it looks cool on your name. Uh, some of the DAOs out there are not really DAOs, but uh, this, is, uh, this is a fine line that you need to think about, and you need to be very mindful when, you, when you're creating uh, an actual DAO. One of the really good things is that you can push the, the power toward the, the edges, meaning that, for example, if you're trying to take care of a community or if you're trying to clean a river or, or do something, you can actually give these people ownership over the project uh, through these uh, the mechanisms and I don't know you can create all sorts of incentives and there are a lot of really cool experiments out there uh, but that's one of the of the main features yeah, if you want to keep all the power for yourself maybe a startup is, is a better a better idea transparency is the, the obvious one uh, everything that goes on chain can be 
uh, seen by 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 anyone uh, with a block explorer and some uh, basic skills. So that's that's an obvious one. Then you have self-executing smart contracts. So potentially you can create something that will self-execute. I don't know, a thousand years from now, or or automatically, or by someone else. Uh, so you get this programming power uh, right there under the hood. Incentives can be integrated, so that's another really really cool thing. That's well, that's why Bitcoin works, um, and that's that's another very powerful thing that, that that you could choose to to have, and it's globally out of the box, uh, meaning that uh, the moment you launch the smart contract, uh, anyone can access. Uh, or almost anyone based on the jurisdiction. Uh, composability is my favorite one, I think. Um, so if you if you want to build something on top of another project, uh, the contract's right there. No one's stopping you. Uh, no one can stop you. So I think that's the, the really powerful thing. And talking about no one being able to stop you, you have the resiliency and the perpetuity. So we kind of know that the Uniswap contracts will work there for eternity. Um, all right, so that was the very short uh, introduction to that. Hopefully, you learned something if you're new. Uh, now, uh, about this niche called governance design, um, and this is uh, what I try to explain to my parents what I do uh, over and over again. So, yeah, this slide might help, uh, but basically, it's the process of designing and implementing any process structure or, or systems that will help any organization. It could be as small or as large as, as you want to make the decisions, to manage conflicts, and to allocate the resources. So that's, that's pretty much uh, all we do. Um, so it's the, the TLDR is uh, we kind of like invent bylaws that then we need to follow. Uh, the, the clear example, uh, or, or an example I like using, is designing a sandbox. So you can, you can think of every decision that you make as a trade-off. So for example, if the walls are too high, the sand might not get away, but then you will actually, um, I don't know, the kids might not be able to get into it, or, or, or the, the, it might be dangerous for kids if you create some really crazy uh, uh, plays or games, but then they might not have enough fun, etc. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much it, like designing a sandbox. Uh, you, you, you need to put some, some thought and trade-offs in there, and that's, that's with how you how you can think of governance design as well. Um, now, yeah, this is what I, what I wanted to talk. It's this real case uh, example that we saw, an issue happening, and how we, we flipped the, the mechanism or the model. Um, but basically, yeah, just to set the, the context, um, this was happening with Maker. We created this system called the, the core units, which were groups that were autom autonomously being um, funded uh, by the protocol, by Maker. Um, and then, yeah, what we discovered is that, uh, not very surprisingly, uh, token holders want value for the protocol. So they actually want to get something. We, we can go up for hours about rage quits and, and stuff like that. Um, then something curious that not many DAOs know is how much of their treasury is being used for protocol development and how much is uh, being used for, I don't know if admin is the best word, but it's uh, anything that has to do with governing the protocol. Uh, so the moment this is not clear, you don't know how much is being spent on bureaucracy and how much is actually adding value to the protocol. So that's a very important um, premise. So going back to what I was mentioning, uh, the MCAR holders ideally have a vision. Um, maybe they don't. Uh, but you really want to believe that they do. So the the way it kind of works, or that they should work, is that the work, uh, or this vision is kind of like deciding what work is being done. That work produces the value or the, or the outcome. So it could be like a new project, an integration, a bridge, uh, I don't know, a, any type of thing. And, and you move from there. Uh, the challenge that we had with this core units model that I was uh, describing is that uh, because we were funding teams, it was extremely hard for MKR holders to actually have a, any type of a direction on, on how this thing worked. So the, the core units were there, kind of like operating as a black box, and it was uh, very, very hard for almost anyone to come and say, hey, 
this is not working or what I'm working on, um, what I, why are you using the funds that we're transferring to you uh, to do what, and then the projects were or were not getting done. Uh, I guess random is not the, the best word, but uh, it was very, very hard for MKR holders to actually direct and give any type of direction. Um, so with, with that in mind, uh, when the bull market, uh, when the markets were thriving and, and, and everything was uh, rosy, um, the way that it would work is that it's like, hey, we need, I don't know, to go on L2s, for example. So any cool project would actually mean uh, that there would be a new CU that would come and do that. So it was just throwing money at the problem and potentially the CU could uh, or could not deliver the work. Um, so again, it was very, very hard to, to kind of uh, give some kind of direction. And um, the main issue that we found is that when you fund a team, it's um, kind of the team decides what they're doing, so they can do something that it's very, very mission critical, and that's, I don't know, 20, 30% of the work. Uh, but the other 70% is some pet project that does not directly benefit the, the um, the protocol and, and this is not this doesn't mean that it's done in a malicious way it's more like the way it kind of works and, and how human nature is um, but yeah going back to the example as soon as the bull market becomes a bear market uh, the opposite happens it's like okay we should st start cutting budgets everywhere so even if a, a, like a new core unit comes and it's like hey we have this really really cool thing that you should implement we can do it for good value uh, that might get rejected, while other core units that were there before from the bull market uh, are not getting any type of, of checks. Um, so it's it's a bit uh, arbitrary in that sense. Um, and yeah, there, there are very weird conversations that uh, were uh, being had. Uh, and these are some of the of the conversations that we saw. Uh, anyone working in in any. Uh, Medium-sized DAO uh, is probably familiar with a lot of those, but uh, yeah, it's a lack of um, lack of vision. For example, it's one of that you hear a lot. It's like we don't want micromanagement. Uh, we cannot uh, just fire teams because it's very bad for the moral uh, KPIs. Uh, what are these guys doing? So you get a lot of noise and a lot of uh, very toxic uh, conversations. Um, that happened, so that's something that you want to, to look for and, and potentially save. So yeah, what's, what was the problem? Uh, confrontation conversations in a very, very, very unstructured manner um, to the point where it's almost a feature to stay low or to lay low and, and just not being seen because then they will just keep funding you uh, while anyone, any other on the spotlight will, will probably be in a much worse position uh, the all, yeah, the all or nothing negotiation means you could fire a core unit, but then if they were doing that, even if it's a 10%, something that's critical, you're kind of losing that. So all the conversations end up in this everything or nothing, uh, which is very, very bad uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, lack of actionable uh, measurement tools. Uh, yeah, the fact that we didn't have a very strong frameworks uh, lead to this. Uh, so maybe someone comes and starts evaluating a proposal in a very specific way. Two months later, this other proposal comes. Might be better, might be worse, but we're not using the same uh, parameters. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something very, very bad for to make it scale, to make it fair for everyone, and, and, and to make sure that we're having the right discussions. And finally, yeah, as I was saying, the vision it uh, becomes quite uh, unclear for for everyone. Um, it's it's even hard for teams to come and join. It's like, what do you guys want? Uh, if if no one's uh, prioritizing the work in a in a good way. So with that in mind, um, this is what we tried doing, and it's like flipping the model. Um, so again. The vision is provided by the MKR holders. Um, I'll get into the implementation in a bit, but uh, basically these budgets uh, are actually funding projects. Uh, and again, you can call them projects, you can call them uh, work, uh, however you, you want to uh, structure it. It doesn't need to be in a time constraint, but basically what, what you end up doing is that you do have teams that might be able to work for different projects, even more than one. 
but potentially you can always change the way that these projects are being funded. Um, so the core unit kind of can come and choose and becomes a bit the, the consumer instead of the one uh, creating the, the situation and the conversation. Uh, and yeah, it, it, if you do it properly, it becomes much more open for, for anyone to come and join. Um, it becomes um, easier for a new core unit or a new team to come and compete if you set up the right uh, process. So, uh, so that's, a, that's an experiment uh, worth having. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to quickly show you an implementation example um, just so you guys understand a bit how this works. But basically the strategy, it's a bit like the vision that I was describing, and that's kind of like out of the scope of this. And what happens is that there will be different uh, DAO level objectives uh, that might be prioritized. Again, that's part of the strategy. But once that you have these objectives that you want to achieve, um, you can have proposals that are kind of like responding to it. So an objective could be a bit like the OKRs, and then these proposals are a bit like the, an answer to the request for proposals. So you just have proposals that are answering to this objective that the DAO has set, um, and hopefully the DAO can choose uh, whatever they, they like best. Um, so yeah, again, uh, several proposals can cover different deliverables of the different objectives. You can set this up custom to your, to your DAO based on the, on the needs, um, but that's a bit, uh, that's what we presented to, to one of the, uh, to another DAO that's, uh, that's not Maker. Uh, but th those were the, the, the custom, um, yeah, the variables that, that we set uh, for this specific uh, DAO. Uh, again, this is just more to, to show you the, the level of granularity, but there were four uh, requests for proposal cycles per year uh, where you kind of like allowed some budget to, to go for this objective. And then at some point, this would be cut uh, and you need to Reinstantiate it if you wanted to to keep going. And yeah, this is my my, my last section. Uh, I kind of added it by by accident in one of the talks, and people keep telling me that they really like it. So I'm either really bad at uh, the first part of the talk, or or they appreciate this. But uh, for anyone that wants to join any type of Web three, um, the first one is an entrepreneurial mindset. So if you kind of like like uh, or if you try to see w where the value is and try to create things from scratch, uh, you will have a much easier time than if you uh, are, w are waiting for someone to tell you what to do. That's, uh, that's usually not how it works in this, uh, in this project. Um, the second one is have lots of drive and curiosity. Um, keep doing stuff, uh, keep learning, keep, uh, keep, yeah, keep coming and, 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 and see what you can do, and eventually you will find something that you like, provide value, and, and, and be onboarded. Um, and this is a bit my, my last time. So if you're not like a super specialist, uh, I, I don't know, if you're a crazy Solidity developer, it might be much easier. Uh, but if you're not, uh, I think that generalists will have an easier time if they start uh, organizing, simplifying, structuring any type of complex information. So you kind of like start documenting it the way that you prefer, then you show it, you kind of reiterate, and eventually you end up with a lot of knowledge. Uh, you're helping a lot of people that, that didn't have this knowledge. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I thought that was very useful for me and, and, and for several people I know, so those are the, the pieces of advice. And the last one, of course, is to, to show up. Uh, so if you keep delivering, uh, you might not find the, the your perfect DAO at first, but eventually you will be at a position where you, um, yeah, where, where someone sees the value that you're generating and they will bring you on board because that's what's best for the, for the organization itself. So yeah, these are my socials. If you guys uh, want, uh, hit me up and we can keep talking about governance. And thank you, happy to take any questions if you want. I think you need to raise your hand or something so the microphone guy run, runs at you. We have a code blue in the microphone department. Hi, 
Okay, I think this one works. Um, are there any DAOs currently in existence, maybe other than Maker, that you think are doing a good job and like other DAOs can take inspiration from? Were you yesterday in Zagreb? Because I got the same exact question. Um, but uh, no, I think there are a lot of different, again, DAO is a, is a, it's a, it's a tricky word. You need to define what a DAO is and then I think decentralization is not binary, it's more like a spectrum. So there are a lot of organizations or foundations that are trying to decentralize um, for, for better and worse. Um, and they have some features or bugs that, uh, that are sharing. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of, uh, of friends or really good acquaintances uh, in the industry uh, from other projects. And, and honestly, I think that they are doing a lot of great things and we're learning a lot from, from each other. Um, I don't know if you expect like, like names specifically, but uh, we can talk later about specific names if you want. Any more questions? Andy, do you really have a question or? Can you talk just uh, a little bit more about conflict resolution and how you're thinking about that? I am in particular interested in like when you turn the core units into consumers rather than like you shall not pass and being a black box around like specifying the work. What happens in the case that there are two different core units that take on the wait, work? Wait, I, I cannot hear anything. I don't know if it's the same for you or it's just me that it's up here. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Hello? Let's try again. Okay, conflict resolution, particularly in the case where you have core units that are competing for the same value for a given piece of work. So say your core engineering and Oracle teams both take on a data availability problem for Maker on a layer two with different solutions. There's only one pot of value available for that. They have different approaches, different implementations. That's probably a good thing. But like, how do you handle conflicts? How do you direct competition amongst your core units towards really valuable outcomes? So the that's, that's one of the main things that we kept seeing is that uh, the, the whole topic got very politicized. Um, so if you had your core unit set up and you were working and there was someone that did something, and it didn't need to be 100% what you were doing, but something adjacently, uh, yeah, comparable to what you were doing and they were good, you could see a lot of really bad excuses and a lot of politics being played where it's like, I don't know, conversations with delegates or why do we need this new project if we have this other one that's being done. Um, so that, that was, I think that was really, really bad because eventually you end up with these bureaucrats that are trying to protect their jobs and, and are not uh, actually, um, yeah, there's a, you, you kind of like are stopping the actual value that the token holder could have. Um, so yeah, this is one, one example. Uh, we, we haven't seen it yet uh, live, but I think that um, this RFP um, time uh, would actually uh, help with that. Uh, and then yeah, you want fast governance. So one of the things that we thought is that if someone kind of like uh, wanted to compete, you would extend the period uh, if there was no one else. So I can say, hey, I want, I don't know, a, a new logo, a graphic designer could say, hey, I will do it. Uh, if there's no one else, you get like fast governance and you're gonna prove it in a week or whatever. Uh, but if someone is like, hey, I also would like to do it, then that would automatically extend the period and then you would go in into the full RFP section where you actually uh, compare the projects and, and you can ask questions and I don't know, give more, um, more details. But all this needs to be managed. It's not that you can just code it. Uh, Anyone that run a grants program uh, know this. Uh, so it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, and it takes a lot of work to actually evaluate, set up the process and, and the, whole, um, the whole story. So it's, uh, it's, it's not that easy. Hopefully I answered a bit of your question. Hi, Juan. Thanks for the talk. It was very informative. Um, a question, 
I think every protocol right now has kind of a dilemma of whether they uh, want to s mm, position themselves as in something immutable, right? Following all the smart contracts and the original vision of something that you know once it's there, it cannot be touched, and and then it's easy to integrate, it's reliable, and so on. Versus an organization that is flexible, you know, it's it's adjust to the market, and innovation is happening, and therefore requires changes, and therefore a committee of people that applies envision and then applies these changes. I was wondering if you can just provide some, you know, an opinion on where it, where, where you stand on the spectrum and some recommendations? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, I think that every project is struggling with that. Uh, my, my main takeaway from what I've seen is that if you can create something uh, that's very, very simple and composable, it's potentially easier to just uh, create it and, and let it run and, and make sure that it's there forever. Uh, it's a bit what we've seen with Uniswap, uh, V1, V2, and then V3. Um, but yeah, you, you know that that V1 is going to be there running forever. So you might migrate to a newer version, but if you decide that something didn't work out, uh, you can you can roll back. Uh, regarding the full, um, yeah, the full project, it really depends what you're trying to build. Uh, I think that it's cool to have, to build things that are going to last forever. Uh, but I think that code uh, should follow uh, kind of like common sense and the need uh, of of us humans at the layer zero. So ideally, we're settling into layer one. Uh, anything that's that's good for 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 the humans and, and the layer zero, so that we're using it for us. Um, so with, with that, what I want to say is like it's not because we coded something 15 years ago. Uh, that we need to, to keep doing that and, and keep using that and, and never change or, or roll back anything. If we, if we decided that we made a mistake, it's okay to go back. I don't see any more hands. So thank you, everyone. This was great.